All right, I think um, let's go ahead and get started. It's, it's just a couple minutes after one. Um, and it is so awesome to see almost 300 of you joining us today for our OPM and DAS training event on understanding state procurement authorities and processes. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, happy Wednesday, happy slightly warmer temps here in Hartford. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. My name is Julia Fussfeld. You've probably um, seen my name in emails. I am the Procurement Policy Development Coordinator at OPM in the Office of Finance. Um, and so you'll learn a little bit more about specifically what I do later in the presentation, but really happy to have you here. I want to go ahead and introduce um, our other presenters and the rest of our team here with us today. Um, we have from DAS, the Director of Procurement, Carol Wilson, um, who will also explain a little bit more about what she does specifically, and um, we'll talk more about her role in procurement, so very grateful to have her here. In addition, we have Kimberly Kennison, the Executive Financial Officer at OPM. She heads up the Office of Finance. She'll also be um, joining us and speaking today. Um, and then we also have two other team members joining us today. Their names are Colin Earhart and Lars Benson. They are super integral to putting this training together and also all of our procurement efforts. They are both fellows from an organization called the Government Performance Lab. Um, you'll also learn a little bit more about what they do uh, later in the training um, and hopefully get the chance to interact with them as well. Um, so that's our team today. Um, and then before we kick off with the presentation. I just want to talk a little bit about the question and answer format we're going to do. So you should have a question and answer submission um, box on your screen and I would encourage you to ask questions um, throughout the event. Those questions go just to our presenter team um, and they won't be posted publicly or necessarily answered in the chat box. Instead, we're going to be collecting all those questions and we'll have a dedicated time for question and answer at the end of the presentation. Um, depending on how much time we have, we're going to do our best to get to as many as possible today. But for any that we can't address today during our question and answer session, we plan to answer in a document and send that out to you folks. So like I said, please ask away, let us know what's confusing, what can be clarified. Um, and we will um, get to those either today or at a later date. And don't be alarmed if you're not getting a response directly in the chat box. And the last thing I want to mention is um, that we have a survey. Um, I've put the link to that in the chat box. I'll do so again, and I'll mention this again at the end of the training. Um, the survey just is to solicit some feedback from you all on how the training went, what else we can train you on, um, and it would be super helpful to us. So we'd be really, really grateful if you could take you know, maximum five minutes of your day just to help us out with that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I think um, Colin's going to go ahead and blow up the presentation so it's full screen. Thanks, Colin. And you can go to the next slide. So on this slide, I'm just going to walk us through um, what it is we're going to be covering today. As you know, our training is called Understanding State Procurement Authorities and Processes. So this is sort of at a high level. Um, we want to talk about the different roles that different agencies play in state procurement. And specifically, we'll also go over what procurement is, what competitive procurement is, just a sort of background information or a refresher for those of you who've been at this for a while. Um, we'll talk about who oversees procurement in the state of Connecticut. Then we'll address the million dollar question, how do I procure goods and services in the state of Connecticut? <laughs> um, and we'll do that in two separate chunks um, for DIS and OPM respectively. Then we'll go through a couple of examples of the types of things that commonly are procured and whose authority that would fall under. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about what you can do if these resources are not enough and you still have some questions down the line. So we'll walk you through um, some resources. And so that's the roadmap. And from here, I'm going to pass it off to Kim Kennison, the Executive Financial Officer at OPM, to get us started on what procurement is. So over to you, Kim. So good morning. Um, first, I want to thank Julia for that great introduction. And uh, she's only been with the state for a short period of time, but you can easily see that she has hit the ground running. And we are thrilled to have her as part of our team here at OPM. So thank you, Julia. So what is procurement? So today, um, the definition of procurement. Procurement is mostly commonly referred to 
as a formal official process of purchasing, obtaining materials, supplies, equipment that you all might be familiar with, or services, especially in the content of business and in government. So procurement ref refers to the business, uh, the entire business management uh, process from identifying the need to to actually um, sourcing for this, to acquiring it, to managing the external resources, uh, that mean your supplier or your vendor. And then after that, if you've had some old assets there, you need to pay attention to, you know, removing those old assets as well. So it's the entire life cycle. At the state, our goal is to get the best quality goods and services at the best price. It involves addressing the it all it involves addressing the economic issues and the challenges at the state, such as going green. You don't want to forget about that when you're doing your procurement. Next slide, please. So why are there so many different roles for procurement? And at the state, um, it competitive the competitive process is required, that is a law, and um, we need to adhere to that law. So why is, uh, why is that important? Well, we're using public funds, and so we need to be very cautious and we need to be careful when we spend taxpayer dollars or federal dollars, and we need to make sure that we spend them appropriately. We want to avoid conflict of interest, unethical conduct, and if we should experience or witness any un unethical um, conduct while we're doing this, it is our job also to report on that. We want to leverage our purchasing power to negotiate the best pricing that we can. Again, the, biz biz the biggest bang for our buck. And we also want to hold our vendors or suppliers accountable for our desired outcomes that we um, acquire to have. Next slide. So what is pro competitive procurement? And now that, um, now I want to discuss pro competitive procurement and competitive com procurement is where you're looking for that best value for goods and services. And this is done by soliciting to the public openly and fairly and anyone can respond to that competitive procurement. Competitive pr procurement is the most preferred way to procure at the state of Connecticut. However, we all know that there are exceptions and those exceptions, there is a process for those exceptions. And that is to request a waiver from competitive, the com competitive process. And that is also known as sole source procurement. Next slide. So the types of, per, per, I'm having trouble with that word today, competitive procurement. Um, the most basic one is an RFQ. It's a quotation, getting pricing, choosing the lowest price. Um, the next one to consider would be a bid, um, a request for a bid process, and where a formal pricing, and you're going to then um, select the lowest price from the, the cost options that were given. We're gonna move on. The next for is a proposal. It's a RFP as we would all know it. And which time a vendor would then provide us with their idea on how they want to accomplish our request. And last but not least is a negotiated agreement where a procurement could be done by piggybacking off an existing contract that already exists, such as like a federal contract. Next slide. So, okay, now we know, we know that we have gone through what pr procurement is. So now you're probably wondering, how do we do that at the state? And the answer depends on what are you going to procure for? Next slide. So Connecticut procurements, there are five different types of entities at the state that have procurement roles and authorities. And today we're focusing just on two of them. It's the top two of the category boxes here. And that is going to be the DAS procurement and OPM finance procurement. So now I wanna take this opportunity to introduce our well-known Carol Wilson, Director of Procurement at DAS. Carol. 
Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be with you all again today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present um, and partner with OPM on this common procurement topics, and we hope this training is helpful to you in clarifying any gray areas. I look forward to answering your questions at the end of our training today with Julie and Kim, and we encourage you to ask them in the chat box so we can cover as many um, questions as possible. What is the role of DAS procurement? While DAS administers statewide contracts for agencies to use, we and that function is centralized, the actual purchasing functions are decentralized, but they must be done in compliance with the DAS statutes, regulations, and General Letter 71, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I also want to mention that DAS co-administers the PCART program along with the Office of State Comptroller, and many of your agencies have that. That's a convenient purchasing slash payment tool, but the same procurement policies and work rules apply when you're using that. Next slide, please. So, you need to procure a good or a service under the DAS authority. What do you do? I want to just let you know this slide may be hard to see, but you will all get a copy of this presentation and um, be able to see it up close. So um, it'll be clearer when you actually have it in your hands. Over the next, um, this is a summer. This is an, an overview slide which will show what's the first step in um, what that you have to do when you need to make a purchase. And I'm gonna take you, break this all down and take you through step-by-step and step in different actions associated with making those purchases. Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about the different thresholds of what you can do when there's not a state contract in place. Um, that that's under general letter 71, I'll go over that um, with you a bit today. And I just want to remind all of those of you who do purchase um, goods and services under the DAS authority, the general letter 71 thresholds were increased in 2019. So you have a greater ability on certain purchases to act within your agency without having to come to DAS for the execution of that procurement. And I'll cover all that. Next slide, Colin. Okay. How do I use a state contract? The very first step you need to take when you need to buy a product or a contractual service is to go to the state contracting portal. The state contracting portal is the central repository for all master contracts and contracts that we also execute on behalf of your agency. For example, if it's a service contract for janitorial services, we would only execute that contract on behalf of your building or that particular location. And all of those contracts we publish for you on the state contracting portal. We also publish the cooperative contracts that we've adopted and um, for example, NASPO value point contracts and some others. And when we do adopt those contracts, those resulting contracts will be posted on the state contracting portal and are available for your use. We'll talk about this a little later, but in addition to finding master contracts available for you to use for your purchases, when you execute a procurement um, for quotes or a PSA or a PS, POS contract, that also must be posted on the state contracting portal. And our goal today is to clear up any confusion on what types of contracts um, DAS does on your behalf, what you can execute on your own, and you know what what are the circumstances where you need to follow the OPM standards for PSA or POS contracts. Next slide please. So this is a screenshot of our main page of the new state contracting portal. As most of you may recall, um, previously the state contracting portal was done through a, an, a technology tool called BizNet. Just recently, we have moved to a, this new to tool um, called CT Source. We're not going to get into the actual training of how to use CT Source, um, as DAS has already hosted several trainings on this topic, 
but we want to emphasize that this is the place where you will go to find master contracts available for you to use. Search functionality is flexible and you can still search by keyword, a vendor name, a contract number, and you can also filter your searches in many additional ways. This is the same public site where your own request for quotes, proposals, and resulting contracts will be posted. And it's called the CT Source Bid Board when you're posting your bids or your other solicitations and can be found in the center column of this screenshot here. The contracts can be found on the far right side and we also include many other resources, educational resources to help you use the tool more efficiently. Next slide, please. So what contracts are out there for you? Well, DAS has nearly 1,000 active contracts for you to use, um, consisting of several thousand different vendors. These contracts are usually called term contracts where they cover, um, you know, they start and they cover three or five year period. So they're out there for that term and you can procure from them. These contracts include just about everything that you're seeing on the screen and, and anything else agencies need, except those things carved out by other statutes, such as construction, PSAs, or health and human service agreements. And um, so the DAS contracts out there are just about everything else that an agency would need to procure. Use the state contracting portal contract board search features to find what you need and filters can help you narrow the search as needed. Whenever in doubt, don't hesitate to contact DAS procurement services staff and we're going to publish our contact information um, on a slide to come so that you have that information at your fingertips. Next slide please. So I've heard this a lot over the years. Why do I have to use a state contract? Why can't I go out and just buy what I need? Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. And um, primarily because the authority to procure goods and services resides with DAS. But there's many other, um, aside from that, there's many good reasons and things we can do to help make your purchasing much easier. We have dedicated staff trained on these procurement functions and we're here to support your agency in the use of these contracts. We are charged to do the leg the legwork for you. When we execute a contract for statewide use, we expect all the volume to flow through those contracts to ensure maximum leverage in our discount levels and negotiation strategies. Um, we discourage rogue purchasing, um, ignoring the state contract. Contract. Um, and we do audit that. We do compliance audits from time to time. If you're not using the state contract, it's going to diminish our ability to leverage common spend and help reduce costs. If we can pool all the, the, the similar needs into one contract, the odds of us getting a better price are more favorable. Therefore, it's extremely important that you use these contracts that are out there for your use. The other thing I want to emphasize by DAS procurement, um, even although I've already acknowledged we have the, the statutory authority to do this, it resides within our agency. Our staff work closely with um, our own legal staff and the Office of the Attorney General to ensure that your contracts are going to protect you from a legal perspective and other statutory compliance measures. We have the purchasing power by pooling all of our needs together through these master agreements. We're constantly striving to help you find small Connecticut owned small and minority businesses to help you meet your set aside goals. And we have a team focused on um, finding environmentally preferable products and other sustainable goods and services that help us make for a greener Connecticut. Next slide, please. So what do you do if a state contract does not exist? And here's where I'm going to break it down um, a lot more for you. Um, if there's not a state contract, DAS has issued a delegation letter. The letter is referred to as General Letter 71. <coughs> Excuse me. It's been around for many years and we've revised it on and off along the way. 
You can always find it on the DAS website by searching on the website General Letter 71. We have other resources, an agency training manual and other informational resources, and you can navigate it to General Letter 71 that way. But um, if you don't have it at your fingertips, it's there on the DAS website. So this is where the fun begins, and I can I tend to get a lot of questions um, about General Letter 71, and they're all good questions. And sometimes there's gray areas, and you're going to hear later in the presentation, Julie and I are going to go over some things the what is this? Is this a PSA or is this a you know a DAS authority service? And we're gonna we're gonna try and um, lend some clarity to those questions out there. Um, the thresholds. So in short, if no state contract exists and you need something, a product or service that's less than five thousand dollars, you have the authority through General Letter seventy one to just go out there and procure that product. We always encourage you to find the lowest responsible qualified supplier of that product, but you, you are not required to get competitive quotes under the $5,000 threshold. If the need is anticipated to be over $5,000, but less than $50,000, we require you to go out and get three, responsible, three quotes from responsible sources of supply and award to the lowest qualified respondent. If the need is over $50,000, but less than $200,000, we require you to post that on the state contracting portal and again award to the lowest qualified respondent. And I emphasize qualified because many times you'll get low bids, but do they meet the the specifications? Can they provide the service in the, the in the timely manner you need? Are they meeting all of the other requirements um, to meet your business needs? So that speaks to qualified. And lastly, if the need is over two hundred thousand um, dollars, the agency needs to come to DAS so we can do a formal either um, invitation to bid or request for proposal on your behalf, which results in a contract agreement. I want to clarify um, a couple things you probably know, but there's a lot of change in staffing in the agency, so there might be some newer people who may not have heard this. The invitation to bid is dictated through the statute, and we have to solicit um, public competitive purchases and award to the lowest qualified responsible bidder. We cannot negotiate on that. We have to accept um, based on the um, the prices in there. And again, qualified and responsible bidder comes into play. If we do a request for proposal, that's more of a solution oriented um, a sourcing technique. And we're looking for um, suppliers out there to pr propose a solution. We can weight the evaluation criteria based on other factors um, in addition to price and they can be um, and those all come into play during the evaluation. Once we've identified and we score these respondents, once we evaluate and score based on the evaluation criteria and weights, we have we can negotiate with the number one supplier and negotiate a contract. We can negotiate price terms and conditions, etc. So we have some flexibility. Um, when we use a request for proposal. So those are the um, requirements under General Letter 71. We also have some carve outs in General Letter 71 that um, we could answer specifically later on or I can speak to you off offline in this training. But overall, that is what you do if a state contract does not exist and you need a product or service. I also want to let you know that DAS uses um, the STARS reporting C, um, system, which is um, extracted data from Core CT, the state's financial system, to analyze General Letter 71 spend. And what that does for us, it gives us the ability to find new contract opportunities. If we want, see a lot of spend in a particular category and under General Letter 71 and we realize there's not a contract out there, We'll, we'll, we'll identify a need and, and execute a new contract so you don't have to use General Letter 71 moving forward and hopefully make it easier for you. 
If we see some spend on general letter 71 that should have been on a contract a compliance type issue, we're going to reach out and educate you. Identify, you know, ask you a few questions. Why did you not use the contract and and try and educate you a little bit more on um, how that purchase might should have been made. In some instances, it might have been totally appropriate, um, but we ask questions to to get down to the details when we do those general letters um, 71 compliance audits. Um, it's also helpful the stars reporting system to us to analyze total spend on contracts on categories, etc, which helps us do a better job negotiating future contracts. Um, these stars reports include P card spend spend on Amazon, which is um, allowable under general letter 71 when a contract doesn't exist and purchase order spend. So um, if you aren't users of stars, I highly encourage it. It's a great tool. Um, to help DAS stay on top of our contracts um, and negotiate the best possible prices. Next slide, please. Why do I need to use the state contracting portal? Um, in short, it's it's required by statute. Connecticut General Statutes 4E13, which is um, the statutes for the state contracting standards board. Um, requires all executive branch agencies, including colleges and universities, to post all bids, RFPs, and resulting contracts and agreements on the state contracting portal. The state contracting standards board is um, the oversight authority surrounding state procurement. And um, one of the requirements is for DAS to host the state contracting portal and for agencies like yourself to use it for all your solicitations and contracts. DAS and OPM don't police this. We can't. You don't know what you don't know, but the State Contracting Standards Board has an audit team and they look at reports surrounding this and usage and um, from time to time they will reach out to you. So it's very easy to comply and with the new State Contracting Portal CT source, I think you'll find complying with this requirement very easy and automated. So You'll hear this later on in the training. We're going to encourage you to continue to use the state contracting portal for all your competitive needs. Next slide, please. OK, so this this almost concludes my overview, but I do want to share with you. You can always contact DAS for help at any time. If you have questions regarding a specific contract, don't be afraid to call on our staff. When you pull the contract up on the state contracting portal, you will see our contract specialist name, phone number and email address, so they're very easy to reach. If in doubt or you're not sure what contract to use, call our main phone number, which is 860-713-5095. And the person who answers the phone will listen to your question. They may be able to answer it depending on the nature of your question or they'll connect you with the appropriate staff person to get you an answer and get you a response. Now I'm going to turn it back to Julia to share with you more on OPM's role in procurement and how that impacts your agency. Julia. Thanks so much, Carol. That was super helpful. And um, thank you also to Kim for laying the groundwork for us on some of the background on procurement. Um, before I move forward from here, I just wanted to um, clarify one um, distinction between DAS procurement and OPM procurement, and that is um, just the different types in broad categories of goods and services that would be procured under DAS or under OPM. Um, and so for DAS procurement, um, the types of things that you would that you would procure through DAS are products or goods, which are you know, tangible items, personal property, such as office supplies or vehicles, those types of items, those are goods, and those are things that are procured through DAS and that um, Carol's presentation covers. In addition, DAS procurement oversees contractual services, which are services like janitorial and cleaning, food service, landscaping, snow removal. Those types of services are also procured under DAS, under what Carol just shared with us. And finally, DAS procurement also oversees IT procurement and telecommunications procurement. So now we're 
back over at OPM, and just by way of broad introduction, we oversee the procurement of professional services. These are things like um, subject matter experts, trainers, accountants, people that have a professional expertise of some sort, that's a professional service. And we also oversee the procurement of health and human services, which are services that we're providing for directly to residents of the state. Um, so I'll get a little bit more into that, but I also just wanted to take this slide to um, clarify that it's the OPM Office of Finance that oversees all of these procurement functions. So um, there are a number of different departments that you might interface with at OPM, and it's finance that um, I work with and that Kim works with um, and that we sort of oversee the procurement rules and processes. And so um, I'll share a little bit more about um, how, do you, how OPM procurement works. And um, so next slide, please. So what is OPM's role in procurement? So the interesting thing about OPM is that we don't have the authority to do procurements directly on behalf of other agencies. So we don't establish state contracts that you can then purchase off of. That's an authority that's reserved and specifically um, delegated to DAS and not to OPM. So our role is more of an oversight and guidance role. And so we do a few different things. Um, number one, we establish standards for the procurement of professional and human services. So this is a document that we publish um, called the procurement standards that include information about what a professional service is or a health and human service, how to procure it, what statute is in, um, involved in regulating the procurement of these services. Um, we also include in that document some best practices for going about the, that procurement. Um, and that's available on our website. And that's sort of a big thing that we do to help agencies do the types of procurements that we work with. In addition, OPM plays an approval role in some circumstances. And I'll get through um, those specific circumstances um, later in the presentation, but that's obviously an important role. And I know a role in which many of you interact with me and Kimberly. Um, and finally, we do reporting. Um, and so we do three main types of reporting that I want to make you all aware of. The first is an annual report on all contracting activity. So any professional services or health and human services that are procured in the state, we report on on an annual basis. Um, and that report includes a contract line by line, contract by contract um, breakdown of how much was spent on what vendors, how the vendor or service was procured, as in was it competitively procured or not. Um, and this is a public report that's available and it's broken down. There's one report for per professional services and one for health and human services. We also report um, monthly on waivers that we grant from competition. So if you and your agency determine that a competitive process is not appropriate for the service that you're procuring, um, you would have to get OPM approval in that instance. And every month we report publicly on any waivers that we have granted. That includes um, the reason that you gave us for why um, competition wasn't appropriate, how much the contract was for, what agency the procurement was for. So that's a monthly report that we publish. And connected to those two things is a three-year procurement plan that we work very, very closely with all of you folks in the agencies to put together. Um, we just went through this process. So I'm sure many of you are intimately familiar with this. And these are forward looking plans that communicate what you expect to be procuring about how much that will be for and whether you expect to do a competitive or a non competitive procurement. So that's sort of a broad overview of OPM's role in the procurement process. But of course, we're sort of really happy to help throughout your procurement process. But this is our formal role. So next slide, please. So what exactly are the types of contracts that OPM oversees? So I talked about the types of services we oversee and, and what do we call the contracts that result from these procurements? Um, and there are two different ones. The first is a personal service agreement or a PSA. And this can be a contract with either an individual or an institution, organization, business. Um, and this is what we use to procure professional services. So should you need the services of a trainer or a subject matter expert or um, I know one great example that I thought was super interesting recently was we helped an agency procure the services of a physicist who can help calibrate x-ray machines. Really runs the gamut and for those types of services we use a personal service agreement. 
We also oversee contracts called purchase of service contracts or POSs. And these are the contracts that we use to procure health and human services. And so these must be with an organization. They cannot be with an individual. And they are result in the direct provision of services to clients in the state. So whereas PSAs were procuring services for state employees, POSs were procuring services that will be given to, um, that will be provided to residents of the state of Connecticut who might need those services. And so this is the contract vehicle that we use for um, health and human services. So PSAs and POSs, if you're doing one of those, that's an OPM um, contract. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you've determined that you need to do a POS or a PSA procurement, what do you do? And the sort of general answer that I want to give is that it depends on your agency specific process. So like I mentioned, OPM doesn't do direct procurement on behalf of your agency. In our procurement standards, we mandate that each agency has its own um, established processes and procedures for doing a procurement. So I'll walk you through this in a general way, but it will really depend on your agency. So similar to a GAS procurement, the first thing you have to do is say, I need a service. Um, and once that's been established, your agency will have a specific process that you have to go through to get your agency specific approvals to make that happen. That could include people from anywhere in the agency. It could include you know, program specific folks if you work in a health and human service agency, fiscal folks, grants and contract managers, all of that has to happen in order to put that contract into motion. And then you might say to yourself, okay, does this contract require OPM approval? And I'll walk you through the answer to that very shortly, but if the answer to that is no, you move forward with the rest of the contracting process, which often involves attorney general approval, and then you can go ahead and execute the contract and OPM doesn't have to have any role in it. However, if you determine that OPM approval is required, you first have to get our approval and then you can go through with the contract to the Attorney General's office and get any further approvals that you need to execute the contract. So I mentioned that this is can be very agency specific. Each agency has an established process for the for initiating this type of procurement, but OPM finance, myself, Kim, Colin, and Lars are available to help throughout the process at many different junctures. So even though we don't necessarily play a formal role outside of the approval, we're still happy to help and provide guidance. Next slide, please. So the million dollar question that I get asked a lot is when do I need OPM approval? And I know this can be really confusing, so I'm hoping that this slide, which you'll be able to access again after the presentation, will serve as a helpful little cheat sheet. Um, so let's talk about when the answer is yes to approval being required. First and foremost, if you anticipate your contract is going to be more than $50,000, it needs our approval. Doesn't matter if it's competitive or not, PSA, POS, over 50,000 needs to go through the OPM approval process. Same goes for a contract that's over one year in length. So if the term is more than one year long, OPM needs to approve it. Those are pretty straightforward. <laughs> then we start getting into slightly more complicated scenarios. If your contract is going to be over $20,000 and you do not think you need to go through a competitive process if you want to do a sole source procurement, that requires OPM approval too. And also if you're doing a PSA with an individual as opposed to with a company or an organization, also needs OPM approval. And the last bullet is that most amendments need OPM approval. There are exceptions. This gets to be a little bit more complex, so I didn't put it in this slide to keep it simple. If there are more questions on that, I can address those in the Q&A or offline. But for the most part, if you're doing an amendment, more likely than not, you'll need OPM approval. When you do not need OPM approval, is any contract that's up to $20,000 and has a term of up to one year. So it has to be both no more than $20,000 and no more than one year long. If it's both of those things, it does not need OPM approval. If the contract is up to $50,000 and one year long in term and, intem and intended to be procured competitively, it also does not need OPM approval. So many different types of contracts will need OPM approval outside of these specific guidelines. 
And again, these slides will be available to you after the slideshow, so you can print this out and keep it as a cheat sheet, and I can answer any clarifying questions um, in the Q&A section. But this is when you need approval and when you don't. Next slide, please. So million dollar question, we figured out we need OPM approval, how do you get it? And so the general answer here is you need to use Core CT. That's the system that myself and Kim who do the approvals use to grant or consider approval requests. And so a couple of general steps, um, and I'll you know, point you to more resources if you're not familiar with the Core CT program. But first and foremost, if you're asking for contract approval from us, you need to have the, the vendor registered in core in advance. So when we get a request, the supplier has to already be in core. And if we don't see a supplier, if we see that field blank, we're going to ask you to go back and make sure the register the vendor is registered in core. From there, um, you will submit a requisition and it will go through the agency specific approval workflow in core. This agency specific authority approvals is really important to us when we're reviewing an approval request. Um, you want to make sure that the person submitting the request is not also the person approving the request. Um, and so we always look for this. And if you are having issues with this or if you don't think your workflow is set up right, again, we'll share a link to how to get CORE to fix it. But this is super important. From there, once it's gone through your agency, it will go to OPM budget. OPM budget is one of our sister departments in this fantastic agency that um, I get to work with, and but they're not the same as OPM Finance. So OPM Budget looks at it first. They review the budgetary implications of your request. They determine how it matches up with your agency's budget. And from there, they determine whether or not to approve it on budgetary grounds. And finally, after that, it comes to OPM Finance. That's myself or Kim. And we review it, and what we're looking for is you know, we're, we're reviewing to make sure that the dollar amounts make sense based on what has been spent on the service in the past. We're also reviewing to see if you're doing a competitive procurement or not. And if you're not, we're saying, does this make sense that this is something that doesn't need to go through a competitive process? Um, and if we have questions, we will put those questions directly on the core CT requisition page. And we only provide approvals through core CT and we like to communicate in the system so that we can keep a record of our communications. We don't offer approvals in verbally or over email. We really, this is a system of records, so we really prefer to keep it all in here. Um, and there are tons more resources on how to work with core, but that's just a brief overview. So we can go to the next slide. So I just want to reiterate, as Carol mentioned really helpfully, um, there is a requirement on posting RFPs and contracts in statute that all RFPs and contracts must be posted on the state contracting portal, which is now CT source. And I just want to point out here that this applies also to POS and PSAs. It's not just for DAS contracts. It's for any contract that you are soliciting for using an RFP or executing those contracts and RFPs need to be posted on the, uh, the state contracting portal, and that includes contracts that result from a sole source procurement. So even if you didn't do an RFP process and you were granted approval not to do com competition, the resulting contract still needs to go on, um, on the state contracting portal. And as Carol helpfully mentioned, this is something that the state contracting standards board has the ability to audit. So it's really on all of us um, and everyone here in the agencies to make sure that they're complying with this statute. Um, so next slide, please. So that's a broad overview of what OPM finance does in the procurement realm. And so here I'm just showing you, giving you our contact information. Should you have any more questions, like I said, we're available to help at any point in the process, even though a lot of freedom is given to the agencies. Um, we want to be a resource and there are several different ways that we can do that. Um, so myself and my contact information is here. Kim Kennison's content information is here. And like I mentioned at the beginning, we're also super lucky to have the support of two additional teammates, Colin Earhart and Lars Benson. They are fellows from an organization called the Government Performance Lab. They're embedded with the Office of Early Childhood, with DAS and with OPM, and they provide tremendous support to us on these teams and also to folks in sister agencies. And so I'm going to turn it over to Colin to go over the next slide and tell you a little bit more about what the GPL is and how they can help. Colin, over to you. Thanks, Julia. So as Julia mentioned, um, I'm Colin Earhart. I'm one of the Harvard Government Performance Lab fellows along with my colleagues, 
Anton and Lars Benson, and we're working across three agencies in the state, DAS, OPM, and OEC. And we've been really fortunate to have been with the state of Connecticut for a little over a year and a half now, really working with different agencies on overall procurement reform efforts, and especially helping agencies to think about using procurement and contracting as more strategic tools to make progress on priorities and challenges, especially what we call results-driven contracting. So thinking about how to use procurement and contracts as a way um, to, to make progress on outcome goals that matter to residents of Connecticut. So how we do that is we work directly with agencies in sort of three ways. The first is in certain cases when there's high priority RFPs, Lars, myself, and Anne will actually partner with those agencies on specific RFPs and actually help them to use tools that are provided by OPM or DAS on RFP writing and help them to actually produce those RFPs in an efficient and effective manner. And in particular, making sure that they're effectively conveying agency goals and objectives to the vendor or provider community. Because as you all know, you're ultimately not gonna be able to select an effective vendor or provider unless you get responses that actually meet your needs. So we work really hard to make sure that RFPs themselves are well communicated to the vendor or provider community. The second way we help is in, in certain cases, we actually run what are called RFP sprints, where we bring together multiple agencies and multiple RFP writing teams to come together to share best practices on RFP writing. So again, in certain cases, we've run this both with DAS contract specialists, as well as with health and human service agencies. We try to bring together different stakeholders from across program, fiscal, legal, to come together and make sure that key decision points about RFPs are happening early in the process to make that RFP writing process more efficient and effective. So those are sort of the first two areas. And then lastly, in select cases, we also help agencies think about once contracts are actually executed, are there ways that they can ensure more effective service delivery for those contracts? Uh, so we call this active contract management and working either with program or fiscal staff to think about ways to sort of fine tune that process. So these are sort of you know three main areas that we help with. But as Kim and Julie have alluded to, we also you know, provide overall guidance around different RFP and procurement best practices um, when asked as well. And lastly, I just want to give a shout out, especially to the Office of Early Childhood. I know Carol and Kim wanted me to thank them uh, in particular for allowing this partnership across the three agencies uh, to make sure that we're really improving procurement across the state. And I'll hand it back over to you, Julia. Thanks, Colin, um, and thanks for that really helpful overview. We're so lucky to have um, the GPL and their skill set with us here, so let's be sure to take advantage of them. Um, so now, as I've we've gone through what procurement is, what DAS does in, in terms of procurement, what OPM does in terms of procurement, and we know that it can still be kind of confusing um, to determine when you when you know you need something, you know, what type of procurement is this? Who do we go to? Is it DAS or is it is it OPM? And so Carol and I are going to chat through these few examples here um, and, and we'll discuss a little bit about our thought process and, and how we came to th these conclusions and hopefully these will serve as some helpful examples. So Carol, what type of procurement um, would office supplies be? If I wanted to procure office supplies, where would I go for that? Thanks, Julia. So office supplies falls under the DAS authority, and if an agency needs to procure office supplies, they should first look to see if there's a master contract on the state contracting portal, which there is. Great, and now we'll go on to training services, um, and I can go ahead and take this one. Um, training services are uh, would be procured as professional services under a PSA. So that's an OPM procurement. Um, and it's a professional service because typically this requires some specific type of professional expertise. And I'll jump in on the next one too. Um, an example of was provided of group homes for persons with disabilities. And this is an example of a POS, a purchase of service. It's the tool that we use to procure um, health and human services that are provided directly to clients. And so these are um, contracts that would be done under POS, under OPM's authority. And um, the next one we have is janitorial services. Um, Carol, how would I go about procuring janitorial services? So janitorial services, is one of those um, quote, like blue collar services that fall within the DAS contractual service authority. So if an agency has a need for such a contract, they'd come to DAS, depending on the dollar amount. In some instances, you can uh, procure that on your own through the DAS authority under General Letter 71 if it's under a certain dollar threshold. 
but otherwise DAS will execute your agency a specific contract for those services. Great, and then the next example we have here is executive search firm. This is um, a service that I've recently reviewed um, and helped procure under a PSA. So typically an executive search firm, this is a professional expertise that would be um, that would be providing services to a state agency that might be looking to fill um, a vacancy. And so that would be a PSA. Um, and then the next one um, is IT consulting services. And I know we've discussed how consulting and consultants are typically professional services, but Carol, um, how would we procure IT consulting services specifically? Yes, thanks, Julia. So IT consulting services falls under the DAS authority. And the reason for that is because the statutes um, that um, oversee personal service agreements, they carve out information technology services because there's a separate set of statutes that address those and um, those fall under DAS currently. So if you have any IT consulting services, you'd come to DAS. We have um, several different master agreements in place um, and IT is um, a fast moving, ever changing um, uh, technology, um, commodity and services, everything's changing rapidly. So new needs come up every day. So don't be afraid to contact us on IT and we'll guide you to the best procurement approach associated with your need. And this is a great example um, as we'll continue to get into with these examples of cases where, you know, you might see consulting and say, oh, that's a PSA and it isn't always straightforward. And that's why we're providing this training and why we want to make clear that we're available so that you can just come to either of us with a quick question um, to determine how to move forward because it isn't always straightforward and, and we acknowledge that and laws can be confusing. And so we want to help you um, interpret those and, and make sense of which way to move forward. Um, so IT consulting services, I think, is a great example of that because you might think it would be a PSA, but as Carol so well explained, it's actually a specific you know, niche authority that's provided to DAS. So the next one on this list is substance abuse treatment services. And similar to the group homes for persons with disabilities, this is a health and human service that's being provided directly to clients, uh, Connecticut residents. And so this would be a POS. Um, and this is you know, something that we also work closely with um, sister agencies to procure um, to get the best services possible to our um, Connecticut state residents. So the next one um, is is kind of an interesting case. Um, Carol, what would you say if I wanted to, if I was hosting an event and I was able to secure the speaking services of a, a celebrity, maybe a, an a famous athlete or a politician, um, and I specifically want to use that notable personality because I think that person is gonna draw um, attendees to my event. How would I go about procuring a specific notable personality as a guest speaker? This one's, this one's one of those gray areas that um, in the past has come to my attention as a question over the years. And in those instances, um, we collaborate with OPM and make a decision on how to best handle those types of procurement. In this case, we have carved out those situations for guest speaker, notable personality, sole source type procurement under, you know, in relatively, you know, they're, they're in your, event for an hour given a speech on a particular topic or they're a draw for your event and that's carved out in general letter 71 section d um, so while logically you might think you need to do a psa on this um, opm and das have collaborated and have carved this out this particular example out under general letter 71 d thanks carol yeah that's another um tricky one right there and and again we're picking out these um you know particularly confusing situations to highlight that it's not always straightforward um and that you sort of have to do a thorough look through of your options and sometimes come to us for help um to get to the bottom of the best way to move forward um all right the next one's diversity training so training is a psa carol is that right Yes, under under most circumstances, training and diversity training would be handled by a PSA individually by the agency. 
But this one is one of those areas where we found that many agencies needed this exact same training and, and certain training requirements are set forth in statutes where agencies have to hire a trainer to conduct um, certain type of training. So in this instances, it didn't make sense for each agency to individually execute a PSA and have maybe 50 different PSAs all for diversity training. It made sense, the best business sense, for DAS to go out and publicly solicit proposals and execute a contract for diversity training services. And again, this is a really good example of OPM and DAS getting together, collaborating, and what's the most effective procurement method for this particular need. And the reason, again, this is now a DAS contract is because many agencies all need the similar service, so it makes sense for DAS to do a master agreement. Thanks for clarifying that, Carol. It sounds like it's never really a bad idea to just check the state contracting portal first. If you're not sure where to go, just do a search with the great search functionality on CT source to see if the service you're procuring for, even if it seems like it might be a PSA, seems like it's worth taking a few minutes just to check out um, the state statewide contracting portal and seeing if there are any options already out there because that makes everyone's lives easier and ensures that it's something that DAS has already vetted for best price and best value. So um, that's sort of what I'm learning from this list of examples. And on a related note, employee assistance services. Again, this sounds to me like a professional service, so I would think it would be a PSA. Carol, what do you think? Exactly. And the same thought process with this. Every agency needs employee assistance services. It falls within the definition of a professional service. However, because um, many agencies need this services or all agencies, it makes sense for DAS to publicly solicit a master agreement so that the agencies don't have to handle separate agreements for those services. So another OPM DAS collaboration and determination on what is the most effective procurement method for this example. Awesome, yeah, so again, hammering home the notion that there might be a statewide contract. So when in doubt, maybe look there first. And then if you don't find what you're looking for, um, time to reach out and, and we can help you navigate the sometimes muddy waters of, of whether it's DAS or whether it's OPM. And so for our last one, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Carol to talk about a real life example of when Connecticut technical schools wanted to contract with the Yard Goat Stadium to host one of their baseball games. So Carol, can you tell us a little bit about this unique circumstance and, and what happens when there is maybe not as much precedent for something and, and how did you advise the agency um, on how to move forward on this one? Yeah, so this is a real life example from about two years ago when the Department of Education came to me and asked me, we have two state high state technical high schools that want to host a baseball competing baseball game at the Yard Goat Stadium and the stadium wants us to sign this agreement. How do we do it? Is it a PSA? Is it a goods and services contract? And in that particular example, we scratched our head a little bit. Um, um, we asked a lot of questions. We weren't quite sure. We looked at the agreement and we bounced back to OPM. Now, I, did, I don't know, perhaps State Department of Education staff are on the call today. I think the end result was they ended up executing this under General Letter 71, but I could be wrong and they might have executed a PSA. I don't exactly recall, but in these instances where the, the waters are muddy and you're not quite sure, the best um, thing to do is to either call myself or my successor in a few weeks and or call Julia and we'll talk this through and we'll find, um, we'll, our goal is to find the most streamlined process for your procurement um, and really look at what's entailed in the good or the service and get you to the most um, effective method. Yeah, so just reiterating what Carol said, it's not always straightforward and we all have to work together sometimes to come up with creative solutions, but we're really lucky that OPM and DAS work really well and collaboratively together. And so we're happy to work with you and each other to come to a solution because at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're getting the services required to um, the appropriate state agency and make sure that 
folks are getting what they need. We're here to help, not hinder. So I think this covers a really nice gamut of the types of questions you might encounter. And the, the bottom line should be, you know, we're always here to help and try to clarify. So thanks for sharing your wealth of institutional knowledge, Carol, on that one and giving us a real life example of, of a time where we just kind of had to work together and, and come up with a solution. So um, I'm going to ask to go to the next slide. And um, this slide is just a kind of a, a general summary of what you just heard. Um, and again, um, I see some people asking, these slides will be available for printing um, shortly after the presentation and we'll send out a notification once they are available. And this could be another great cheat sheet um, printout takeaway that just sort of summarizes what we just said and includes some of the examples that we've used so that, you know, if you are confused, this could be a good, a good quick reference. Um, but next slide, please. We recognize that um, it's not always straightforward as I think a bunch of me and Carol's examples illustrated. And so there's additional information that you could refer to that might be able to help. Um, DAS has agency informational resources and a procurement manual. And again, these are links. And so when you do get the printout of the slide, you'll be able to just click these from your desktop and, and learn more. And DAS also has a great procurement manual that you can reference that um, refers to a lot of the steps that Carol walked us through earlier. Um, in terms of OPM, as I mentioned, we have a procurement standards document that walks through a lot of what I talked about, as well as some best practices about how to do procurements, how to do RFPs. And in addition, we have a new RFP template for the procurement of human services that our excellent GPL fellows helped us put together um, and, are, and are happy to help you populate. It's really great and um, is focused on some of those outcomes like Colin discussed. And finally, I know I talked a little bit about Core CT and how this plays an important role in the OPM process. And Core CT has published a ton of job aids that walk you screen by screen through the core pages to show you how to submit a requisition. And there's also a core help desk. So if you are feeling like you're still not getting the hang of it, they provide training, they can correct workflow issues, and they're super helpful and responsive. So we encourage you to use these resources. Um, next slide, please. And if for some reason you're still not finding what you need, as we mentioned, hopefully we've hammered this um, into your heads well enough, we are available to help as well and we want to be helpful. And so as Carol mentioned earlier, um, each of the statewide contracts has a um, procurement specialist, a contract specialist published on that statewide contract page. You can reach out to them by phone or email. And there's also the DAS main procurement line that can help you if, if they can't answer your question right away, they can find the right person to help you. Um, these links, when you print out the slideshow um, later, once they're published, will have uh, links to my email address and Kim Kennison's email address. We're also available to answer your procurement questions. And then finally reiterating our awesome GPL fellows, Colin and Lars, these are their email addresses and they are super helpful and we should take advantage of their wealth of knowledge too. So. You know, again, you can print these out once we share the, the published slides and hopefully make good use of them if there's any confusion coming up. So next we're going to go into our Q&A section. Um, it is 2.05. I'm going to let Colin moderate and share some of the questions we've received. And then Carol and I um, will do our best to answer. Carol, Kim and I will do our best to answer these. So Colin, um, what do you got for us? Thanks, Julia. So we do have about 40 questions or so, so I don't know if we'll get through everything, but as Julia mentioned at the start, we'll definitely post written answers to any questions later uh, later on. So if we don't get to your questions, definitely look out for an email letting you know where to find written responses to your questions. Uh, but to get things started, I don't know, Carol, if you want to take this. Um, Julia addressed sort of the process for sole source procurement for POS and PSA contracts. Do you mind talking a little bit about how standardized transactions work for DAS? Certainly. So. Um, Standardization transaction is, is the statutory word. Um, it's um, for a waiver of the competitive process. And how that works is if there is an emergency, a true emergency, you know, a public health, public safety um, emergency, we have the authority, DAS has the authority up to a certain amount, and after that, the Standardization Committee has the authority to approve a waiver of the competitive process. 
The statutes all also um, allow us to waive it for certain sole source situations or unusual market conditions. Now, sole source conditions aren't just the um, preferred vendor you want to go to solely. It's a true sole source where no one else can either provide the product or do the work because it's proprietary or other unique reasons. There's no one else out there. When that happens, um, an agency, if they have a situation where they need a waiver because of an emergency or those circumstances I just mentioned, you submit through Core CTE Pro uh, a Core 10. It's called the DAS bid now, and you identify it as a standardization transaction. It's a requisition. You route it to DAS um, with the need. It will be assigned to a contract specialist. They will review it, and depending on the dollar amount, if it's under 50000 we have the authority to review if it's a legitimate sole source or emergency or um, usual market condition situation. We will approve it or deny it. Um, if it's over 50000 it goes to a committee set forth by statutes, and they vote on it. Um, the turnaround time in that situation is usually a couple days, and then we'll we'll send you approval documents and we'll work with you on the contract. Great, thank you, Carol. Um, so the next question might be for uh, Julia. Will there be additional information or possibly a future training on the OPM requisition process to actually walk through the specific screens and questions that are asked? Thanks, Colin, and thanks um, to whoever asked that one. Yes, um, that is um, one of the exact uh, training topics that I have targeted um, that I would love to move ahead with. And so look out for more communications from me um, with more information about an upcoming training on that. I know it can be confusing and different agencies have some different sort of standards about um, which, uh, how exactly to use the core CT requisition process. So definitely something that um, we intend to train on. In our survey that we'll send out after this, you can also indicate that that's something you want to be trained on so we can prioritize it and look forward to um, helping clarify those specific processes with a walkthrough of the core software as well. So thanks, Colin, and thanks to whoever asked that one. Sounds great. I think this next question might be for Carol. Um, what if you can get a better price from vendors than a price that's on a statewide contract? This is a really good question, and I've heard it many times over the last 24 years. So at any given time, um, uh, anyone can meet or beat the contract price on a state contract. Um, we get that all the time. We, we do a public bid, bids come in, we award the contract to the lowest qualified responsible bidder, and six months later, a company down the street sees the prices on the state contracting portal and said, oh, I can get you that same thing and I'll knock $100 off it. Or you see an ad in the Sunday paper. Well, not the Sunday paper anymore, but you know where you can get an appliance or something for $100 less than what the contract price is. That's all very true, but you still need to use the state contract. And here's why. There's many protections built into the state contract. Um, there's legal protections, there's business requirements, warranties, um, extended warranties, service delivery um, requirements, etc. There's protections against performance built into the contract and many other protections, um, including some um, social preferences that sometimes impact cost. At any given day, a supplier may say, I can beat that price, but where is that supplier on the day the bids are due? Can they agree to all those legal terms and conditions? Can they hold that price for a year or more? Can they agree to all the state requirements that sometimes are legislatively mandated? And many times they can't. They can they say, hey, I can sell it to you for this. You come pick it up and, and then you're on your own. In some of those instances, they're selling um, not an apples to apples type product as well. There's many different situations. Um, we still require you to use the state contract in those instances, but bring those price um, circumstances to our attention. And some of the things what we'll do is we'll reach out to that contractor and say, hey, 
if you can give such a great price, this bid is going out next year at this time. Why don't you participate so you can help save us money? Or we might go back to, if this was an RFP, go back to our contractors and say, hey, we got companies out here that are trying to sell us the same stuff for less. Can you lower your price? So bring that to DAS's attention and um, we're going to require you to use the contract, but we will try um, our best to understand the circumstances and either get that supplier to bid in the future or to improve on our contract pricing that exists um, in the current situation. I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I think this next one is for Julia. Um, if a PSA is for an individual, does that individual need to register as a vendor in Core CT? or is vendor registration limited just to companies? Thanks, Colin, um, and thank you for that question. It's a great one, and yes, the answer is yes. If you're an individual um, who's gonna be paid by the state, um, you do need to be registered on Core CT, and so we say that all the time um, for PSAs with individuals who are serving as trainers or consultants or any number of types of professions. Um, there is, um, you know, a system as well, um, the same system that you would use to register a company, you would use to register an individual, and we would want to see that individual registered as well. And this also ensures that um, we, that the payroll office has the right in the accounts payable office has the right information for this individual so that they can be compensated for their work they're doing for the state. And also that the individual is getting their the own their the tax documents that they might need. So this is a really crucial part of the process and um, applies both to individuals and organizations or companies. So thanks so much for that question. I hope that clarifies. Thanks, Julia. Carol, I think this question is for you. Can you talk a little bit more about the use of DAS statewide contracts by municipalities or LEAs? Um, yes, I don't know what LEAs are, but I can talk about municipalities. Um, so the contracts that DAS executes, the master agreements, we open up for all state agencies to use, and we also open them up for municipalities to use. Municipalities are not required to use our contract, but we know resources are strapped. So it's if if their state uh, if their local charter permits them to to piggyback from a state contract, those master agreements are open for their use, with very few exceptions. I will also say municipalities are also. Um, can use our CT source system to post their own bids and solicitations. And um, we've reached out to them through our, our trainings last month, and um, we encourage um, we encourage them to use our resources. They're free of charge, and um, we hope our contracts and our system will help ease and make their processes more efficient as well. Thank you, Carol. Uh, so the next question I think has to do with OPM procurement standards. There's a question about when those standards will be updated and how will folks know when the updates have been made? Thanks, Colin, and thanks for that question. Um, so the current version of the OPM um, procurement standards are um, from, were last updated in 2014, I believe. And myself and my and our team are working hard to get that updated to modernize and reflect some of the realities of a more digital world. Um, and so we're doing a medium term update. And then um, as well as Kim mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, I just joined the state in July. And so it's definitely on my radar to make something of a, um, of a you know, OPM procurement guide or handbook. Um, so to make the procurement standards also fill that role. So all of these updates are underway. Um, we know that it could use some updating. And so we hope to get those out to you as soon as possible. When we do, um, we'll communicate that via email. We'll also be updating the procurement standards page on the OPM Finance website. That's where you can find a lot of our um, resources. The link in this slideshow to our OPM procurement standards will bring you directly to that page where new standards will be updated. But we will make announcements. And of course, we will also hold a training um, once we make any changes to make folks aware of what those changes are um, and to bring everyone up to speed on new versions. So keep your eye out for that. Um, thanks for using the standards. I know um, it's been a, a little while since they've been updated, but we're excited to, to get a more updated version to you as, just as soon as we can. So, and in the meantime, any questions on the standards as they exist, please do reach out. So thanks for that question.
Thanks, Julia. Uh, so the next question is for Carol, and it's about the CT source system. Uh, how can I invite vendors or providers that aren't in the CT source system to participate in a solicitation opportunity? We encourage any vendors that are not currently registered in CT source to get registered. And we do have a supplier resource page on our CT source pages, which um, you can get to by going to the DAS website, clicking on the state contracting portal, then clicking on CT source, and you will see a, a page dedicated to suppliers with instructions on how to register, um, et cetera. Um, if in doubt, you can always call DAS staff at 860-713-5095, and we can provide guidance on how to get those suppliers registered. Thanks, Carol. Uh, so the next question I believe is for Julia, which is about the um, requisition threshold. So what if a PSA is exactly $20,000? Would I need OPM approval? And can we send requisitions that are less than $20,000 to OPM for approval? Thanks, Colin, and thanks for that question. Um, this is a really good question and it comes up a lot. So if a contract is exactly $20,000, it does not, and it is a you know, fulfills all the other um, uh, specifications that make it exempt from OPM approval. So if it's up to, if it's $20,000 and one year or less, it does not require OPM approval. If it's $20,001, it does, but the 20,000 is included in that no approval required threshold. Um, so again, I know that that can be a little bit confusing. Um, also mentioned in our standards, but just to reiterate, if a contract is $20,000, it that does not in and of itself mean that it needs to be approved by OPM that is within that $20,000 threshold. Um, to your second question about um, whether you would need to submit or would want to submit a OPM, um, a, a requisition for OPM approval um, outside of those circumstances, the answer is to really try to only submit an, a, an approval request to OPM if it requires OPM approval. And the reason for this is that we field a lot of these approval requests every week, as you can imagine. And in order for us to, to prioritize and make sure that we're providing approvals where they're really necessary, it's great to not have the unnecessary stuff in our, in our work in our workflow. And so, you know, if you could use this cheat sheet and the standards to help monitor whether or not an approval is required, um, that would be really helpful to us and to your colleagues in the state who might have urgent requests. Um, but if there is something that you wanted us to look over or help you with that is prompting you to put it in the system so that OPM can see it, don't hesitate to reach out via email and we can certainly um, help address your questions outside of CORE. But, um, but really we'd like to limit those core approval requests to the ones that are absolutely necessary. Um, does that answer the question, Colin? Yes, I believe so. And we'll definitely kind of write that up as well and folks can respond if needed. Great. Um, I think the next question is for both Carol and Julia, uh, which is essentially how do the procurement rules outlined in both the presentations about DAS and OPM apply to municipalities and public quasis? Okay, so on the DAS side, those rules do not apply to municipalities nor quasi-publics. Um, municipalities, again, have the option to use our contracts and they have the option to use our state contracting portal, but they're not bound by any of our procurement rules that agencies have to go by. Additionally, quasi-publics generally have autonomy and um, in their statutes where they can do their own procurements and contracting. We're always happy to lend assistance, but um, generally they have autonomy. Yeah, and the same goes for OPM. Um, we don't have oversight over the quasis, um, and um, since we don't do any statewide um, procuring, um, the municipalities wouldn't have the opportunity to work with us either, so, um, so that would be a separate process. Thanks, Julia. Carol. Uh, so I think the next question, and I know we're getting up on the end of the session, so I'll probably do a couple more questions. This one's for Julia as well. Can you give an example for when an amendment would not need OPM approval? Um, I can try to be as succinct as possible. So um, 
how about I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to answer it in the flip side because that's a little bit easier for me and I'll speak slowly so that you can jot these notes down. And um, I'm glad you asked this super important because I know I just said most amendments and that's not super helpful, but it is a bit confusing. So I'll walk you through it. Um, I'll walk you through the cases when um, OPM approval is required for an amendment. So you need OPM approval for a contract amendment if the, the cost of the original contract is more than $50,000. So if the original contract was more than $50,000, if you're doing any sort of amendment, OPM needs to approve it. That's one circumstance. The second is, if the amendment has a cost of 100% or more of the original contract, it needs OPM approval. So that means, let's say your original contract was $25,000, if your amendment is twenty five thousand is to add an additional twenty five thousand dollars or more, OPM approval would be required. So again, that's if the amendment has a cost of a hundred percent or more of the original contract, it requires OPM approval. The third instance where OPM approval is required on an amendment is if the amendment will increase the cost to more than fifty thousand dollars. So let's say your original contract was twenty five thousand dollars. If the amendment is for, well, that's a bad example. So let's say the original contract is worth $30,000. If the amendment is for 21,000, that would bring the total to 51,000, that would require OPM approval. So again, that's if the amendment increases the cost to more than $50,000, OPM approval is required for that amendment. The fourth instance is if the amendment extends the term of the contract beyond a one year period. So as we discussed, there are cases where a contract that's up to one year in term that don't need OPM approval. So let's say you had a contract that was for a year. If the amendment is going to extend the life of that contract beyond that first year, you would have to get OPM approval. Um, and the last reason is if it's the second or subsequent amendment, it needs OPM approval. So if it's anything other than a first amendment, no matter what the amendment is for, it automatically needs OPM approval. So those are the five reasons. I know that was a lot. It was a mouthful. I tried to do it slowly, but I'm, I'm not always great at that. So this is something that will be sure to write up in our answers as well. But as you can see, that's sort of why I said most amendments, because most of the time you are going to need our approval, but there are, of course, cases where you won't. So thanks for that question. I apologize for the confusing answer. But we'll be sure to get that out in written form to you as well. Thanks, Julia. So I think we'll do two more questions and then hand it over, Julia, back to you to close us out. Um, so the next question is for Carol. Can DAS contract specialists support our solicitation if it's less than $200,000? That's a good question. And while we have delegated the um, your ability to do procurements under $200,000, we're always willing to help you if um, you don't have the resources to do so or if you need if or the experience to do so. So, um, We've increased those limits to give you more flexibility. However, the true authority resides within DAS, and um, if there is a need which you cannot execute on your own, we're happy to assist or do it for you. Thanks, Carol. And then last question for Julia. The OPM RFP template that was mentioned, are we allowed to customize that to fit my agency's needs? So great question and glad to hear about a little bit of excitement for the template. Um, the answer is if you want to do something with the template and, and work around what's in there, please reach out to myself or Kim or Colin or Lars and we can talk to you about what exactly those customizations might look like. Um, in general, the template is there so that it can walk you through a process that we and the GPL have found to be most advantageous to get the best quality services. And so we want to be careful about those customizations, but we also want to be sensitive to the unique circumstances that a human service agency might be facing. And so reach out to us, talk to us about what that might look like, and we can always walk you through the template, explain why things look a certain way. Um, there are also terms and conditions in there that really can't be modified, so we want to be sensitive to those. But any questions on how to work within that or how to tailor it to your needs is something we would want to discuss on a case-by-case -case basis, and we would really encourage you, don't be shy about reaching out if you want your if you want our help um, working within that template. So excited to hear that folks are interested in that, and we're looking forward to hopefully working with you guys on on um, on getting the RFP that you need out. Thanks, Julia. I think we'll hand it back to you to close us out. 
All right, well, we'll just move to the last slide and just um, want to say thank you, thank you, thank you again for your time, um, for spending an hour and a half with us here on Wednesday, um, and hopefully you learned something. Um, and um, we're really looking forward to giving you a couple of more of these trainings in the near future. I also want to reiterate my thanks to Kim Kennison and Carol Wilson, who did such a fantastic job presenting, and to Colin, who sort of did a ton behind the scenes, shared a little bit about GPL and helped us through all your awesome questions. And to Lars, who you didn't get to hear from today, but I have no doubt you'll get to work with him soon. Um, just a fantastic procurement team here, and it's just makes doing our jobs awesome to be able to work together. Um, so thank you all. Thanks to the presenters. I want to do one last plug for the survey that we're providing. I'll email it out. I'm going to put it right once more in the announcements. Um, this is shouldn't take more than five minutes of your time to give us a sense of how we did, what we can train you on in the future, um, and any other food for thought. Otherwise, we look forward to hearing from you over email, to seeing you at future trainings, to seeing your requests, to seeing your action on CT source, um, and really grateful for your time and um, great to be with you all. Stay well and we'll see you soon. So thanks everyone. I want to make one last comment. This is Kim. Um, I want to thank Julia um, for her hard work in pulling all of this together, pulling the team together. Carol Wilson for her great input today, as well as uh, the GPL team of Colin and Lars. So uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Take care, everyone. We're going to um, go ahead and end this event. And like I said, we'll follow up with recordings where you can find the slides and the survey link. Please reach out with any questions and we will talk to you soon. Take care, everyone.